Celtic Stuff Live. Welcome to Celtic Stuff Live on the CLNS Media Network, the leading online provider of audio and video coverage for the Boston Celtics. I'm your host, Justin Poulin. With me, as always, John Duke. And if you are a follower of ours on YouTube, make sure you check out the bonus clip this week. John's son, Carter, makes his first appearance. And as we've talked about on previous podcasts, we were going to bring him on to talk about the sneakers that he got from Marcus Smart after a tweet that, John, you made um, when Marcus Smart was just hanging out on Twitter one night. You talked about the huge comeback game in Houston in the early part of last season and what a big uh, impact uh, Marcus had on the outcome and that win, that major come behind victory. And so it was a pleasure having Carter on that bonus episode that people can find on YouTube. The reason you have to look at it on YouTube is because you get to see Carter in all of his Celtics gear and he shows off the sneakers as well as a pregame photo that you took with your entire family with Tom Heinsohn. I mean, you know, number 15, hanging out with the fam. I mean, you know, just no big deal. And then, you know, the greatest comeback of all, probably the game of the year, let's just say. And then, you know, we, we, you know, put the cherry on the Sunday by getting some sneakers from uh, my youngest son's favorite player. Yeah, you know, other than that, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both had exceptional visits. Both comeback victories. Yours, yours, a much bigger comeback victory than the Super Bowl Sunday one that I attended with my parents and and my son Riley. But a little uh, future sneak peek. You have two boys that are both diehard Celtics fans. We've been talking about it for a while, and at some point this off season, we're going to continue mingling in. I guess the legacy. Uh, of the, you know, of, uh, Celtic stuff live. And we will, I know Riley, uh, got to do a halftime video clip with CLNS media. Nick Gelso, um, graciously came up at halftime and got our predictions for the Super Bowl that evening, et cetera. Now Carter's been on and your other son, William, maybe we'll get him and Riley on to, uh, to do some shows and, and we'll get them involved and, and pass the torch over, over the next 20 years, so to speak, John, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> 20 years as we age gracefully into retirement, you know, yeah, it's, it's true. It's great to get these guys in. I mean, I mean, again, you know, when we first started the show. I mean, these kids were either infants or not even born, you know, and your girls and, and, and my boys and, and Riley was just, you know, uh, came up to your, uh, you know, just an ankle biter, I guess at that point. Just he was guy. born in 03. So I think by the time he was but, one, you know, we were, I was dabbling in podcasting and then, and really 03. When did Danny come on board? 03. It was yeah. 03, right? So. Yeah. Danny's been with the club 15 years and Riley's 15 years old. And, uh, you know, it is, it is sort of funny how that all played out, you know, and, and we got behind the scenes. We love to reference the, the old times and, you know, we do definitely do when we talk with Carter about, you know, who we met in the, in the background and who we didn't and who we've since had an opportunity to meet since we gave up the press credentials, which by the way, um, we passed on to CLNS media, who's now our gracious host of Celtic stuff live, uh, and our home network. So that's, that's a wonderful thing for us and really worked out well for everybody, but we love to talk about those old times, but be really cool. If, you know, some of those old times got carried through and started over, but it's, it's, it's funny how it all lined up with the same year that, that my son was born and, and now we're talking about 15 years later, Danny's done a wonderful job and is currently in the second iteration of a very, of fielding a very competitive potential championship club. And, uh, and, and now we get to share it with our kids. That's really, well, first off, it just tells us how old we are. <laughs> Absolutely. It, we aren't do the show live. We, you know, in the early years, we did the show live and everyone could listen, it, listen to it on Celtics blog or our own website. Now the L maybe just stands for legacy. Maybe it's Celtic stuff legacy now at this point. I know, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's crazy how it's all changed, but, uh, yeah, we're now at that point. Our kids are old enough to have opinions and, and care about who to like and who not to like and why they don't like this kid, this guy and that guy. And, uh, 
Uh, so it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and now we're, you know, we're kind of at that stage now with these guys. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's going to be fun. It was a great show. I hope everyone gets a chance to check it out. And it's kind of nice to have, uh, you know, the old guys, you and I uh, have some younger blood in here. You know, we're, we're instead of always being the older guys, you know, podcasters, you know, these young bucks like, like Bobby Manning and Sam Sheehan, you know, maybe, you know, Matt Ignall, these guys, De- Evan Valenti. No, 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 no. We, we'll bring, we'll go, we're going even younger, man. We're, we're going to get that, that vaunted eight to 15, uh, demo under the our demographic. Belts. That's right. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to put the squeeze on those millennials. <laughs> There you go. That's Absolutely. Man. I love Absolutely. your strategy. I don't love that you just divulged it to the world, but no. I don't care. <laughs> We're coming for you. We're, We're coming, coming for you, 20 year olds. Look putting out. Squeeze on. Monkey in the middle. Here we go. <laughs> That's classic. Well, well, speaking of, you know, you and I evolving, one of the things that you were saying is, isn't it crazy that we can all just grab a computer, a tablet, and and do a show like this just on video. Like before, when you came to my house, we did our first, or not our first, but one of the live draft shows that we did. You came to my house and we recorded it together. And there were like three laptops, a TV, five pieces of recording equipment, you know, leveling, et cetera. And, and now we're literally just doing it on a, on a, on a laptop, you know, really a Microsoft yeah. Surface Pro is what I use. So it's, it's funny how far it's come. And, uh, you know, speaking of that, I remember when we first got on Twitter, right? I remember when Twitter was born. Um, that's kind of funny, but it's true. Uh, we saw a lot of advancements over the course of doing this show. And a reminder to everybody, you can follow Celtic Stuff Live on Twitter at CSL underscore Tweet Live. You can follow me at CSL underscore Justin. John is at CSL underscore Duke. The entire CLNS Media Network at CLNS Media. Facebook.com slash CLNS fans. Download the CLNS Media app. For iOS and Android, simply search CLNS Media in your app marketplace. And finally, the YouTube channel. We want you to go there because you want to go see not only Celtic Stuff Live's playlist and the uh, video that we mentioned with Carter and Marcus Smart. Thank you very much, Marcus. His shoes. But there's also all kinds of high-definition there's full length locker room interviews during the season, the garden report. We see trags on there. So much content, not even just about the Celtics, but all New England sports and beyond as well. The entire network represented on that YouTube channel with fabulous content. So let's but, jump into the show. Oh no, you know, but I just want to say one thing about the channel and, 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 and I, I know we're going to jump into this, but if you have not seen the Celtics round table, their conversation with the Riffs man, you need to do it. Go on there right now. I know you've you been away. I'm not sure Justin Twitter. saw. You just, uh, uh, you just tied Twitter, which was the, the opening transition dude. into that network announcement, right into the back end of it with the YouTube channel. That was fabulous. The Riffs man you. and the round table. Synergy, baby. Synergy. No, I listen. It was hilarious. It was great. It was epic. Um, you need to go and watch that. Watch my son. Watch the thing with my son. Yeah, yeah, my kid. Get my kid out of the way. Then go watch this. I mean, it's great. I mean, you will. I'm telling you, it was it was amazing. So, I love it. Anyway, I'm sorry to step on the transition into the next phase. And and really, I think what you're going to talk about is a transition to the Celtics as a team. Their next phase. This is a big part of it, is it not, Justin? Well, yeah. So Marcus Smart. I believe is where you're going with that since we just talked about Marcus and the shoes and everything else. So you being a perfect transitioner, just like that. Excellent segue. We're going to talk about Marcus Smart signing the four year, $54 million deal. Or was it 52? Was it 54? 52. 52. It was 52. Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. So, cause it comes out to 13 million a year flat is what I kind of remember. Well, there is the half million dollar being fit bonus as well. So I'm not sure if that makes it being before. fit bonus. Yeah, there's a weight clause in there. Mm-hmm. Thousand each that's year, interesting. So. Yeah. Right. Kenny Marcus. Okay. You know. okay. So that's the other. So it is 54. It's a guaranteed 52 with a $2 million kicker if he looks like what you just said, springy Marcus that we saw in the middle of last season where he came off of that, uh, what was it? Four week stretch? 
five weeks after bashing oh, his hand? At least, yeah. I think more. I think it was, uh, it was, five. It was five. It was five, I think it was yeah. five or six. Somewhere in there, yeah, yeah. Either way, he missed an extensive amount of time when he came back. He was a leaper. And uh, it was pretty exciting to see. You know, the other thing is everybody knows your jump shot's all in your legs. So, you know, maybe Springy Marcus ends up becoming a more consistent shooter over time, um, which would be nice, you know, for somebody who's, I think, shot, what, 29% career, 28% career from three-point land. It's low. It's low. But either way, at the end of the day, they sign him. We know he's got all the intangibles. We know that really the one thing he doesn't have is he's not an expert marksman. But outside of that, he contributes in so many ways to this club. And also, and you and I talked about this before, but they don't have a lot of salary matching potential in trades, but they have a lot of picks. They have a lot of assets. You know, our next topic, which we're not ready to head into yet, but it's going to be the Kawhi Leonard. I was excited to see that the Celtics were willing to give up not core pieces of talent, but any pick or really any combo of picks to be able to, you know, secure a talent like that, that they knew was uncertain for the long term and was going to be a one year rental. That would have been worth the gamble. All of those picks for sure. There's enough young talent on this team to carry them to the future. If they won the championship, you know, trying to figure out what they were going to do with re-signing, which would have been difficult anyway, worth a one year gamble though, to truly have been able to compete. Instead, Kawhi goes to Toronto, but the point being, that it made sense all along, and we talked about it throughout the season, it made sense for them to sign Marcus Smart just if for any other reason than when the roster gets a little tight and they start to have to make decisions around some of these players and who they can sign, that they've got the ability to to package some deals without losing some of the, your, your younger players that you know are going to be here long-term like Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. Totally. I mean, no doubt, no doubt about that. I mean, that's... Putting him in a, putting the Celtics in a position where they're, you know, the, the issue always when you sign a long term deal and what the Celtics have had really since they've started, you know, even from 13, I guess, when they started to move away from KG and Pierce is like the, like we want to be flexible. We want to be able to do everything. And this was the first summer it felt like, okay, now we have what we want. We've got to somehow solidify that over the long term. And Smart was the first piece where the Celtics were going to have to say, you know, look, we see value here. We value the player and we value flexibility. In in the case of Kelly Olynyk, it was flexibility because we want to get Gordon Hayward. And in the, in the case of Evan Turner, it was, <laughs> sorry, Evan, we love you, but we're going to go after uh, Al Horford. And by doing that, and with the Celtics making those choices, they were able to keep themselves flexible. Now they're in the position, clearly, and as you said, I mean, the, the Kawhi things, they really do intertwine here. There's a feeling, I think, for the Celtics, they're, they're in a championship contention right now. They're, you know, they're this close, you know. Maybe maybe it's this close, but they're they're clearly in that mix to be able to win this thing. Certainly to get out of the East, who knows, beyond. And so why wouldn't you do your best? Why wouldn't you bring your best? And the guy that, you know, look, there's a lot of talented players on this team. Marcus Smart has his shortcomings, but he very clearly is a winning player. Every winning player, you go back through history, there are players like Marcus Smart who perhaps don't, um, you know, their numbers don't necessarily, you know, make you, you know, your eyes widen and say, wow, this guy can really get it done and it's filling up the bucket. But they're winning players. They fill in the gaps where other guys are unable to. That's what this signing was. This is the Celtics saying for $13 million a year, we think it's important to have that guy as we make our push here towards the ultimate prize. And I think that that's important for this team. It, it would have been fine, sign the qualifying offer, sure, maintain flexibility. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but I think this is an, this is, this is the type of, of, you know, slap on the back for the culture and the players that are in that locker room. Uh, I think it's just a, a big win for everybody involved with the Celtics. Yeah, and they really needed it. I mean, Marcus was getting frustrated, and there was no market there for him, really. And so they easily could have stuck him with the qualifying offer. They could have done all this bad blood kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, he winds up getting what we all thought he was worth. I mean, I remember saying I thought he would get 12 to $14 million a year, closer to 12 because he couldn't shoot. 
And, and I don't mean like because he absolutely can't shoot, but it, that's the way this league is right now. It is full of shooters. And so the fact that he brings something different to the table and then he gets recognized it with a get recognized for it with a contract that is, I would say even overpaying, honestly, John, but because of the market, not overpaying because of the player, but overpaying because of the market. They could have strong armed him a little bit. They might have done a one in one type of deal with a team option and, you know, squeezed him down under 10 million a year even because that first 10 million was going to be awesome. And, you know, and then he maybe figures, well, we could get, tra- I could get traded. You never know what happens, you know, but 20 million in the one on one deal. There's a lot of different things that could have happened. Instead, they give him the four. They give him over 12 million a year. The opportunity to earn 27 million a year, basically, or no, not quite 27, right? No, um, no, 13 and a half. Sorry. 13, 13 and, and a half, half a year, 54 total. Um, you know, that that's much closer to the 14 million side of things. And so I think that that sh- you know, it's goodwill with the agent again. Danny, I guess is uh, that's one of the underrated things with him is how well this organization works with specific agents and how that those things like really help them in negotiations. They've gotten some good deals in certain scenarios. We talk about somebody like Al Horford where we don't know how Maybe he's going to play here long term, but maybe they wind up giving him a, a stretched out deal for a lower yearly salary, but more money into his twilight years to stay on a very competitive franchise. You know, those things all play into these types of decisions. It's how do those agents trust the, trust the GM and trust the organization? And this kind of a move definitely lays more groundwork for, for future scenarios like even the Al Horford scenario or Maybe there's a player that doesn't want to be traded or won't commit to a long term deal and the agent says, I know I've had great, you know, great experiences with the Celtics. You know, you should consider signing a, a sign and trade extension. Um <laughs> things like that. It's all money in the bank. You know, that's that's certainly something that has been part of the Danny Ainge uh efforts, I think, in Boston ever since he's been a G a you know, GM here or head of basketball ops. I mean, he's he's always been exceedingly fair, in my estimation, to agents. I mean, the, the Jeff Green contract, for example, was one where some of us could have squeezed him. You know, and I think, you know, publicly, he probably you know could have gotten away with not giving him that deal. But he kind of did a solid for, for David Falk, you know. Um, there's a lot of those situations where, you know, Danny has has given a little bit. You know, um, he's done a lot for Mark Bartlestein. He's done a lot for a lot of these guys and you see it pay off. And, and I think the Hayward situation is one where, you know, he was fair to a number of Mark Bartlestein's clients over the years. And who knows what sort of role Bartlestein had in, in, in that conversation with Hayward, but it didn't hurt to know that, that, that was that you knew that he had a good relationship with Danny. And so, these things matter. And, you know, if it's a million or $2 million, you know, what's it matter? Well, you know? So I'm going to jump in on this because we're going to, we're going to skip around the Kawhi Leonard. We're going to talk about this because we're talking about relationships with Danny, relationships with the age. I mean, with the agents and we're talking about the sense of loyalty. And that's such a perfect segue to the Isaiah Thomas phone call to Danny uh, before signing a deal with, I believe, the Denver Nuggets, correct? That's where he's headed. That's right. Yeah. yeah one so, so one year, small deal, and he reached out and said, Hey, I'm not opposed to coming back. And you and I had talked about it. And I think Danny basically cited the fact that no decision was made yet with Marcus Smart. I think that would have been an acceptable sort of backup move at the guard position for them. But with Terry Rozier, going to be struggling to find minutes that really weren't in a position to bring Isaiah back. But you and I had sort of prophesized and hoped about it and even talked during the season that, you know, if they don't bring back smart or smart gets sent off in some sort of a deal that what's the possibility that it might come back. And it has been pretty public about, you know, he says things like this league, man, you know, there's no loyalty. There's no loyalty in this league, you know, and, and to some degree, you really, I mean, I love IT and it's hard to disagree with his perspective. It's unfortunate that that's the way the cookie crumbles for him. And, um, 
you know, he did. And, and he's absolutely right. He put his health at risk. He decreased how much money he was going to make. And he did it because, you know, he wanted to go out there and he wanted to play basketball. And let's not, let's not diminish the emotional pain of the loss of his sister motivating him on that. I mean, he went out and set what a playoff record, uh, uh, record setting performance for points in a game, uh, for a, for a Boston Celtic. Um, right after that, the next game he played. I mean, that's just phenomenal. And you can't take that away from him. I, I, it actually hurts my heart that he doesn't get paid and that, you know, he sacrificed that and, and really remember his tooth coming out of his face during that run. Like he left everything on the floor, including, you know, his opportunity to get that Brinks truck to come out. Stupid Kelly Oubre. Yeah. No, I, you know, <laughs> that's the tooth member. Um, yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, that was heated. I, yeah. Stupid Kelly. I mean, you know, that was just a weird thing with how they hit and whatever. But, um, I, you know, I think the whole thing with IT is that there's no loyalty, right? Sure. But the fact he was willing to pick up the phone, talk to Danny, you know, it wasn't dismissed out of hand. There's a lot of reasons why the Sullivan's can say, well, look, we got, you know, we got these three guys. And if we don't, we got Larkin and, you know, we don't know how healthy you are, IT. There's a lot of questions. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for Danny to, to not do that, but that's not the way he is. And I think the karma of it. Okay. <laughs> Let's not even talk about, we talk about those, those relationships, right? I think the door is open. I don't think the door is closed for Isaiah Thomas as a Celtic. Now, does it make sense? No, it doesn't. But it doesn't Celtic- make sense right now. But we've been right. talking about how are they going to finagle all these guards? And, you know, you even look at a deal like um, Schroeder going over to um, – uh, OKC okay, back OKC okay, to back up Russell Westbrook, right? I mean, here's a young player, uh, obviously far younger than Isaiah Thomas, but somebody who burned the Celtics up in a heated matchup where Atlanta kind of smoked him a few years ago. He was what 21, 22 at the time, and uh, yeah. and hit some real big shots. He's only 24 now, scored 19 points per game. He's basically identical to Westbrook in that he's a 29, you know, 30 low 30s, high. 20s three-point percent shooter yeah shooters 29 no 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 what's he talking about he's like westbrook hold on oh you mean he's shooting percentages okay. yeah shooting percentages. Okay. his splits like the gotcha. the B- yeah no 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 totally not not no westbrook <laughs> like, is what? obviously otherworldly no but shooting, he's like that in now westbrook's got a higher had a higher field goal percentage, 48% last year. And that's where the differences sure. are, like sure. Westbrook's ability to attack the rim, et cetera. But those splits and, you know, you, you look at Atlanta just kind of saying, okay, we're going to move on. We're going to move to Trey Young, et cetera. But they're giving up a very young player coming off the bench. The only real comparison I was making there was offensive guard, starting caliber player coming off the bench. Um, to provide offensive punch. And that's what IT could do once they sort out this guard rotation because it is hard to imagine them holding on to Terry Rozier, Marcus Smart, and Kyrie Irving for the long haul. However, with Kyrie a little up in the air, and I don't, and I think he, I think he's coming back. I'm not really scared about that at all next year, but Danny is so good at hedging. He's going to hold on to Rozier and Smart until the very last minute because if all of a sudden Kyrie were to move on, you know what I mean? Then he'd be letting a player go that he's been grooming to take the reins. You know, so much better to save a little face and be like, all right, we didn't keep Kyrie, but Terry, have we got an offer for you? You know what I mean? And Marcus stays in that role. They do get out a little bit. Somebody comes off the bench. You know, we kind of see what we saw out of Rozier in the playoffs. He goes with that younger kind of crew. Maybe he still tries to make a deal. Maybe even swindles some sort of a sign and tradey kind of thing with Kyrie. Who knows? But he's going to hold on to these assets until he knows exactly what hand he has to play. There is a timeline. I said this on Twitter. There is absolutely a scenario where Kyrie leaves. Rozier returns, and the Celtics give the full MLE over two two years to Isaiah Thomas. There is a way that that can happen. You know, 
the current team, it makes no sense to have him on this team. It just, it, it's crazy. It's Finding too much of a long game. It's just going to be upset. Right. Absolutely. Again. He There's, needs an opportunity to go get that paycheck. We it's don't even go, know. Yeah. Right. We don't even know who's going to finish, finish games. Isaiah may not even finish games with, with Denver, but he's definitely, he's much further behind, you know, in terms of this team. But, you know, a year from now, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think the fact, Again, I think for karmic reasons, I'm happier about that, that, that conversation between Danny and Isaiah than anything else. For karmic reasons, I just don't like the way that all went down. Even if everyone knew they were doing the best thing they could for what they had, you know, and, and one thing I want to say though, speaking of that is, and, and some of that of Woj's conversation with Isaiah, he says, well, you know, I, I played anyway with my sister and all that. And it's like, there was no way that guy was going off the court. That is not Isaiah Thomas to say, well, I'm going to shut it down and get my hip better. It's just not who he is. Now, maybe he's learned. Maybe he's he's cautious. Maybe he's learned those things. But the guy that was Isaiah Thomas here, the guy that made him great, he's not going to shut it down in the playoffs, even if the hip's bothering him. And, you know, unfortunately, it it really hurt him. He should have gotten the surgery when when he, he when he had it. It didn't happen. But here we are, and let's hopefully he gets his brinks truck sooner or later. Yep, amen. All right, we'll see. In the meantime, if you wear contacts and you know how annoying it is to have to get a prescription year after year just to be able to buy more contacts, well, Simple Contacts is changing all of that by using technology to make renewing your prescription and buying contacts super, well, simple. And here's how it works. Using your phone or computer, you can take the Simple Contacts vision test in just five minutes, literally from anywhere, and then a real doctor reviews your test. That's within 24 hours, writing you a new prescription. Boom, a fresh supply of brand new lenses on the way to your door. No more appointments, no more waiting rooms, no more overpaying for your contacts simple contacts brings the doctor's office to wherever you are whenever you need it which as much traveling as i do i can tell you how convenient it is every time i schedule an appointment even with my dentist i gotta cancel it so definitely with the eye doctor sometimes i'm wearing glasses for a few weeks this has changed everything for me because while i'm sitting in that hotel room not having anything to do and not spending that time with my family while I'm on the road, I can get some of my errands taken care of so I'm present when I'm home. And Simple Contacts allows me to do that by just hopping up the computer, taking the vision test, and by the time I make it home from my trip, I've got contacts right at home, ready to go. Simple Contacts offers every brand of lenses. Their prices are unbeatable. The prescription is just $20, and the contact lenses are super competitive pricing-wise. Shipping is free, and best of all, our listeners get $30 off their first Simple Contacts order. So to save $30 on your lenses, just go to simplecontacts.com slash CSL18 or enter the code CSL18 at checkout. I do have to mention, though, that this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need those occasionally, but it is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts if your vision hasn't changed. Again, check out Simple Contacts. Get $30 off by going to Simple Contacts. Contacts.com slash CSL18 or just enter the code CSL18 at checkout. Give it a try and thank me later. Two more topics on deck, John, for definite, definitively. One, since we just talked about Marcus Smart to kick off the first half. In the second half, let's just talk about a couple more minor deals. I said on Twitter, no way do they let Jabari Bird walk. He showed some flashes last year, and not those like weird flashes where, oh, he's playing against junkie players, blah, blah, blah. Like, I actually think there's a player in there that's going to wind up maybe not with the Celtics long term, but maybe. Kind of depends on how the roster shakes out. I think there's a player in there. I think there's a journeyman 12 to 15 minutes off the bench, kind of defender, hustle guy, igniter. And a lot of it, you know, in the NBA, a lot of these guys come up with the talent, but they just don't have the fire. They just don't have the passion. We just got done talking about Isaiah Thomas. Unfortunately, he had so much passion and so much fire that now he's actually paying the price to some extent. But that's how he got here. And that's where I can draw major uh, parallels with Jabari Bird. I feel like Bird has that passion. He definitely ignited the team in limited minutes. He came in hot. Remember those backdoor cuts and passes and layups, all of that stuff was fantastic. I think he earned it. 
I think the Celtics saw it, and there was kind of a question mark. Well, there's a two-way player. They even did better. Again, you talk about taking care of some of these guys. Jabari Bird earned it, and they gave him a contract to be on the team. Not a two-way you know, kind of deal, none of that stuff. They gave him, you know, hey, you're on the team. That's important. Doing that kind of acknowledgement, because you look at Nader, they had to get rid of Nader to make space. And um, I think that was the right move because even though Nader had the passion, he didn't have the ability. He just was never going to make his mark. Watching him try to turn the corner against an NBA defense was just really tough to watch. It was brutal. And, you know, Nader, to Nader's credit, I mean, he did everything he was supposed to do, played the summer league, played well, turned that into, um, you know, a, a D league contract, got rookie of the year. And then, you know, kind of stopped, you know, after the D league season last year, didn't have a great summer league. Yeah. Uh, he didn't turning, really RJ hunter know, it, but he kind of Jordan Mickey did. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's exactly right. You know, he, he had this great kind of initial, Hey, look at me. And then it just never really came back. Jabari bird in summer league kind of just said, no, 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 I'm going to keep playing. Well, I'm going to show this progression. And, you know, as a result, he's, he's earned that spot. I, again, got to take this opportunity to, to complain about the fact that the two way, uh, contract rules don't allow those players to play in the playoffs. I think it's insane. Sellers could have used Jabari bird. The hospital Celtics had, you know, like, 12, you know, 11 guys, you know, dressing for some games in the playoffs. Why the heck Jabari Bird couldn't have been on that roster dressed up is insane. NBA, fix your stuff, get your CBA work, and so those two-way players can play if you have a guy but the two-way like, player like was Hayward progress. couldn't play. The oh, two-way it, player it is, was progress. But, They're going to work the tweaks out over time. Like, well, I, I agree it, with you. Tweak it, baby. Tweak yeah. it. They got to tweak it. Tweak it. But who knows what kind of work is involved in that, right? You just mentioned the, the very recently renegotiated contract with the union, right? So who knows? Who knows? But but having said that, they also had to let go of Kadeem Allen, who really never impressed, to be honest with you. I mean, maybe one game early on in summer league after the draft last year, but outside of that, um, just didn't appear to have that stuff. So... They wind up going and they get Walt Lemon Jr. And I'll be honest with you, I know nothing about this cat. Do you? I think he's uh, Liz Lemon's brother from uh, 30 Rock. <laughs> Pretty sure. Pretty sure. <laughs> Is that all we got? That's all I got. Do we need to bring got. an expert on the show? <laughs> he's Liz Lemon's brother, man. <laughs> Hanging out with Tracy, Tracy Jordan and, uh, you know, Jack Donaghy. And it's great stuff. Jack Donaghy. Wait, Donaghy. Hmm. Tim. Tim Donaghy. Wait a second. Yeah. See, I'm telling you, there's something there. It, there's Tracy some serious Jordan, JB, Jordan. tinfoil hat stuff going on mm. right now. And most people, you think? Uh, most people may not know JB at this point, considering we get, you know, six to 10,000 views on YouTube, but it's before my face turned this red that, uh, you know, <laughs> Thanos. <laughs> I love the Thanos mentioned. <laughs> By the way, we haven't Did talked about this at all, but there's at least every week. I don't know what's going on with the color. Maybe it's the maybe it's the background. But every week, some somebody has to comment on YouTube about what's what's wrong with the guy with the yeah. red face. And you know what I said to uh, one of them? I said, you know, yeah, just wait. Keep talking like that. He's gonna snap his fingers, man. And then, uh oh, then there's yeah. a problem. So you never know. You never know. Happen. All, I, all I can is. tell you is it's even more red this week because I was at the beach. But I seriously do not have a sunburn. I promise you. This, you know, adjust your dial. You know, That's get it. the get yeah. the settings correct. <laughs> um, so you know, all right. So we we kind of hash some of these. End of the bench, you know, D leaguey or G leaguey, uh, level players, but I have high hopes for Jabari Bird. I'll be honest with you. I think he has, has stood out a cut above a lot of these second round flyer picks that the Celtics have done in the past. I actually have a lot of hope for this guy. I think he's got some talent, whether he'll sh- have the opportunity to show that with the Celtics or not. I guess we'll see down the line. Now we really have to talk about this. It's amazing. It took so long for us to get to this topic, but Kawhi Leonard 
Um, they finally move him. San Antonio ships him off to Toronto. They really were looking to get some sort of an established star back. They wanted to stay relevant, so they didn't want to just completely hit the reset button for the franchise. And really, while you have Popovich, why would you do that? I mean, um, they were able to not compete really much in the playoffs, but they were still competitive during the regular season, and Kawhi didn't play a lick. So now they're adding... DeMar DeRozan. Now, is that enough to even get by the LeBron Lakers? I, who knows, right? We'll have to see how this matches. But but one thing I you've got to give DeRozan is the big knock on him. Obviously, there are some concerns defensively, but it was really his ability to shoot the three ball, and he went out. He did what the Raptors asked him to do. He improved his three-point shooting percentage substantially, and now he's going to go and have a really stable system with consistent expectations and really the best coach in the league over the last 20 years. Um, at the helm. We might see, and I'm just going to throw this out there, especially defensively, we might see a little leap from DeMar DeRozan in San Antonio. And right now, we know Toronto got the best player by a long shot. We know that. But maybe this trade doesn't look like what it seems to be at first, whereas San Antonio kind of lucks out because they get a guy on a long-term deal who's actually going to play for them. And then on the other hand, you, you got to scratch your head with Toronto a little bit and say, this guy wants to be in L.A. and you just sent him to Toronto. Now, he sort of does have to play because he's got to prove that he's healthy. So the gamble for this year, good for Toronto, makes sense. But ultimately, it gives them the opportunity to roll the dice at a time when they need to. Based on the success of the Celtics, even though Cleveland you know, lost LeBron and maybe that door was open, um, for Toronto, I, I think the, the Celtics kind of success at this point that they were kind of looking at it and with the Warriors being as strong as they are, et cetera, it was like, are we really going to be able to win a finals with this crew? Probably not. So if we go get Kawhi and he winds up liking it and he kills it on the court for us and is the player that we've known him to be in the league as one of the top five players in the last three, four years, if he's that guy, then maybe it's worth continuing to try to get there and if he bails on us after the season we have all the all the wherewithal at that point to say okay he's gone now we're going to blow it up Kyle Lowry gets traded and they hit the full reset button and their coach which is a development coach that they just uh nur- nurse is his last name I can't remember Nick. his first name is Nick it Nick nurse. yeah yeah Nick nurse so now they put him to, to nurse the young players in a rebuilding progress, right? I mean, a rebuilding program. Right. But that gives them, that really puts them in an absolute perfect scenario. You know, they said, Hey, we, we really went after it and we gave you a great product. Um, and, or it didn't work and now it's time to, to blow it up. And, um, you know, I actually think it was a smart move for both franchises. This is a, this is one of those very rare win wins. No, I think so. I think you're right. It, it made a lot more sense than the Celtics being involved. Uh, and, you know, the Celtics were more, um, just had less on the table. They didn't have what San Antonio was looking for. Apparently the Celtics were somewhat aggressive in the number of picks they gave, were willing to give up and the quality of picks that they were willing to give up, which is kind of interesting in terms of trying to figure out what their value system is and, and how they want to put a team together. Uh, for this coming season and beyond. But uh, no, I agree with you. I think it made a lot of sense for both sides. Toronto, they're off of the big contract that, that DeRozan signed. So worst case, you've got OG and Anobi and Fred Van Vliet and, uh, Siakam and all these guys, these young players that you can use as the, the new core, as you said, with a development coach and then sell off the old pieces if it doesn't work. If it does work, well then, you're in the mix. And, you know, looking at Toronto, looking at what that team is, they've got a lot of wings. I mean, they, they're probably the only team in the East right now that can throw as many wings at the Celtics as the Celtics actually have. Siaka, Mananobi, um, you know, obviously Kawhi, you know, and then you talk about Deron Wright and, and, um, um, you know, Van Vliet as a, as a, as a pure guard. Um, and then you've got some bigs there. I mean, that's a, that's a team that's, that's interesting. And as in terms of player for player, I think it's, it's a, it's going to be a really, um, fun matchup to see those teams match up. I still like the, where the Celtics are. I think in particularly the center position, they've got a, a real, um, leap ahead and, 
I'm not, you know, a lot of people were talking about what Toronto has been against the Celtics. That's, that's old news. Like if you want really the Celtics of last year is really the first time you could get a sense of what the Celtics are going forward and how they would play against the Toronto team. The Toronto team right now, it's different now. So it's all different. It's going to wipe the, wipe the map up. Um, what happened two, three, four, five years ago against Toronto it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, let's hear them now. And, uh, you know, I think it's great for, for Toronto and I hope it doesn't work for them because, um, I want to see the Celtics go to the finals and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, Kawhi gets traded to LA and they have to give up the young pieces and <laughs> it's easier for the Celtics to get to the finals. I'm, I'm purely mercy. I mean, there's only one interest I have is the Boston Celtics and everybody else. Forget them, man. Well, yeah, of course. Off, I mean, eh? as it should be, honestly. As That's it what it's be. a boot. <laughs> Although, when you look at my face, you'd think I was a Bulls fan. So, <laughs> all I'm saying is 100% agree. I hope that it blows up in Toronto. I think they're going to be a fierce competitor. Uh, the defense is going to be really strong. They're going to have a very good defensive team. However... I think the Celtics ability to space it out and attack from so many different angles is going to help immensely. And I do think that on some level, it's the offense of the Raptors is going to be a little disjointed, to be honest with you. Like Kyle Lowry is going to be able to put it together, you know, and obviously he'll be able to rely on Kawhi to generate offense too. But I just think that's becomes a two dimensional offensive team. And it was kind of always that way, but there was this chemistry between DeRozan and Lowry that that's the wild card for me. It's not that that it's not, it's not that Leonard and well, you know, it's not that Kyle Lowry can't still be Kyle Lowry and that Leonard can't be as good or better, you know, better probably of an offensive player, but it's a chemistry piece. If Lowry is really feeling like Leonard's kind of just, you know, riding out the year, and they're not on the same page, and Leonard is kind of riding out the year and just trying to stack his points and set up the contract. I think things could get a little ugly on the court, and and it might not play out in the it might not play out in the locker room. It might not play out in the media. Everybody might be you know just a hundred, but those two DeRozan and Lowry were tight, and it was part of their success. You know, and it's the chemistry factor. And, and I think that that might be lacking and that that could end up being their shortcoming. I'm not saying it won't. Hey, the two could hit it off and, and Leonard could find himself, uh, surprisingly loving Toronto and loving the franchise and love, but, but I'd say that that's a 20, 80, you know, 20, 20% chance of it happening, 80%. He's out of town at the end of next year. And it's, it's, it's a, again, it's a worthwhile gamble for Toronto to do that, but I don't think the odds are really Well, they can say they did the best, they did the best that they could mm-hmm. to get over the top. We had to do something. We weren't going to get there and we weren't going to, even if we got you to the finals, we couldn't win the finals. We needed a top five player. We brought him in and, you know, it's just not going to work. I, I think it allows them to hit the reset. It gives them permission to do all the things that they needed to do. And who knows? They might still be able to make a move during another, during the season and add another piece. They're not afraid to do that. They've done that year after year and loaded up. You know, they, they beat us out on PJ Tucker, which seemed, you know, seemed small. But we really could have used PJ Tucker. I still think there was some shenanigans that went on into that. Why Ryan McDonough wouldn't deal him to Boston. I still haven't understood that. I feel like that was personal. political, right? Political. I, I think so. I think so. I don't think it was. I, I had heard that, you know, and I read somewhere that the, the Sulks had the better offer. Now, what does that mean? Why? Who knows? But yeah, it, you know, PJ Tucker was, he, he was. Of course, didn't get them any further in the playoffs than the Celtics got. Oh, by the way, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, you yeah, know, the like, point is, is that they'll make moves. Right. They're not, they will. you know, they, they're a pretty unafraid franchise, and this this one really exemplified that to a T. This was the most boldest of moves, but it also was one that they couldn't lose in. They, re- I mean, there was no- really Toronto had nothing risky here. Right, and I think what it what it sets up though to me. It's kind of interesting. Everyone was teeing up this summer as, okay, this summer is going to, it's going to change the paradigm. And, you know, Kawhi, you know, uh, Kawhi is going to make a decision and LeBron's going to go here. And, and I think now as we're kind of like tipping toe 
beyond the summer now. Now we're heading into August. I think we're looking and saying next summer, next summer could be the one that the game changer, you know, 2010, you know, LeBron made, you know, obviously the whole Miami thing, 2014, him going to Cleveland, that changed everything. The next year, KD went to Cleveland, to Gold State, but that really didn't change the way the league is set up. I think for the first time since 14, a move is going to change. And the question is who it is, what's going on with KD and Golden State? Is, is Kyrie happy here? Does he want to stay here? Uh, where does Kawhi go? Who's going to join LeBron in LA? To me, those questions are going to be, they're really going to make this, this season almost a bit uneasy. And it could be a situation where it really causes the whole league to sit back and say, we got to do something different with these contracts. We got to find a way to keep guys where they are because while the conversation is good, it undoes what makes the league great in terms of building these long-standing rivalries. It's great to have LeBron well, and, just and Kawhi owners, and, man, and Kyrie in Boston. Yeah, but- Owner, owners are going to give up, and and it's going to go to the big market teams um, for all the reasons that we've seen in the past. Like they're going to have to, they're either going to have to contract the league to some degree, um, you know, or they're going to, because that's what that's the way you fix it. You contract the league and keep the cap the same. So you basically push people out into the G League, push people out overseas, and then keep a top, more top tier talent on different teams so that just, you know, getting these people to go to certain places doesn't guarantee them championships. And, and that's, that's really the two options. You either find a way for the drafting team to be really the unprecedented place to stay, you know, but they'll never be able to prevent this late in the career move. You know, that last career contract, you know, um, teaming up in a certain area when people have already made, you know, a boatload of money. There's no way to fix that. That part is done. But a KD joining Steph and, you know, Clay Thompson and Green. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this. I also think the underrated part of the Kawhi Leonard trade is Denny Green. Because I yep. think, I mean, I think that is a huge bolster and, and to the, to the team. Now, is it huge, huge? No, but because they're willing to make those midseason moves, depth, depth actually is an issue for Toronto. So adding green, I think was a nice underrated addition to that deal that, you know, ultimately maybe based on situation, you would have just swapped Leonard for DeRozan, right? Long-term commitment for San Antonio, big risk, gamble, better player for Toronto. But they also kind of sneaked it to green into that deal. And I, I think that's another huge win for Toronto. Yeah. I think, I think it's a plus. I mean, I think, I don't think Danny, Danny has, Danny Green has not played. Um, as great the last couple of years as he did, you know, kind of when, when Duncan was there and, and things were really, um, they were really true championship contenders. Yeah. He's a player but, in search of a role. There's no well, doubt. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he was for, let's see, he had from, uh, the 12, 13, 14 and 15 seasons, he was all somewhere between 41 and 43 percent from three point land. And since then he's been 33, 37, 36. So not to say that he's a terrible player now all of a sudden, but he just hasn't been really as effective from the stripe, you know, from, from, uh, from the arc. And so I mean that he's um, that much of a lesser player and, and they were ready to be off of his money too. Maybe, you know, I think the fact that, uh, the fact that the, that it was strange that the the San Antonio was willing to throw him in, it seemed like that was almost like we want to get off of this this contract and, and this situation. I don't know if that's true, but it felt that way. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what what Danny Green's got in the tank. Maybe a change of situation will you know invigorate him. But what I would say is too, how many times have we seen Pop sign some guy that has washed out or hadn't made it? Turn them into something. They go somewhere else and not nearly the player they were for him. That could be what we see here with Danny Green too. So maybe, I, I, except the decline's already been there, right? So, so that maybe it's worse. This could be could be worse, or it could just again, it could be it, it could be the uh, the negative or the end of the yang of that scenario. Like um, maybe there was a point where you know they they. Danny Green wasn't listening to Pop anymore. 
And, and that's the reason for the reduced role. And sometimes, you know, maybe, uh, look, Nick Nurse is going to be a completely different coach than Greg Popovich. That, Absolutely. that I can guarantee. Yeah. I, the, uh, what's interesting too is, uh, coach of the year, uh, to the stars there, um, that, that Toronto did have, he probably is a better fit to, in Dwayne Casey than Nick Nurse with this team. But, you know, the, which is why know. it almost just says, we don't care, Kawhi. Come here and do your job. Yeah. We know what's right. going to happen. And if, but, but also on the other hand, you know, if it does start working out, you know, then Nick's, Nick's earned the opportunity to coach Kawhi. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Kawhi's yeah. not going to get somebody else. So if that works and they've got a season to kind of like work on Kawhi, but they know the odds are low. You know, they can kind of play the role of the dark horse candidate throughout the year and end up coming out on top. Look at Paul George and OKC, right? Nobody thought, everybody thought he was going to be in LA and LeBron did what he said he was doing. Paul George didn't even entertain it, which is ironic considering, you know, this time last year, we were saying the same thing about Paul George going to the Lakers as we're saying about Kawhi going to the Lakers and Paul George quickly sign back up to stay in OKC. And so, you know, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. So definitely not. Definitely not. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this week's show, but the broadcast will be available on demand on the CLNS media mobile app. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at CSL underscore Justin and at CSL underscore Duke. Make sure you check out our bonus video this week with John Sun Carter and Marcus Smart Sneaks. A heartfelt thank you to everybody for tuning in. And remember that you can help support the show by subscribing to Celtic Stuff Live on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd love it if you gave us a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. For staff writer Samuel Elias, executive producer Larry H. Russell, the founder of CLNS Media, Nick Gelso, and my co-host John Duke, I'm Justin Poulin. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Celtic Stuff Live. Celtic Stuff Live.